Welcome to the International Broadcast Ministry of No Limits. I am Pastor Delman Coates, and here at No Limits, we want to help strengthen you, encourage you, and empower you to feel God's love and to live your life without limitation. Today's message is about to begin, and I want to thank you for watching and know that I'm praying for you to hear a special word from God as you watch. I want to invite you to turn with me to the gospel according to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, and I want to read in your hearing verses 1 through 11 from the New Revised Standard Version. It's a very familiar story. Many of you have heard this story preached uh, time and time again, and I hope to take a different approach to a familiar passage. John chapter 8, beginning at verse 1, and the word of the Lord reads as follows. It says, when Jesus went to the Mount of Olives early in the morning, he came again to the temple and all of the people came to him and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and making her stand before all of them, they said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the very act. Somebody say in the very act in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law of Moses, it commands us to stone such women. Now what do you say? And they said this to test Jesus so that they might have some charge to bring against him. But Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground and when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he finally said to them, look, let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at this woman. And once again, Jesus bent down and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, they then went away one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone then with that woman standing before him. And Jesus straightening up said to her, woman, where are they? Where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, sir. And Jesus said, well, neither do I. Go your way and from now on do not sin again. Amen. And I want to try to preach today, church, from the thought, I wish the church was Christian. Is that all right? <clears throat> do me a favor, help to announce the title of my sermon to your neighbor. Look at your neighbor. Look at your neighbor, some of you still looking at me. Look at your neighbor, smile at your neighbor, say neighbor, oh neighbor, I sure wish the church was Christian. Come on, put your hands together and give the Lord praise today. I'm gonna do the best I can, by the way. At some point or another, most if not all of us have reached a point in our lives where we have decided to quit, to resign, or to step away from some organization, institution, or job that we were a part of. It could be a fraternal organization you joined, a university you attended, or a place of employment where you worked for many, many years, but at some point you became frustrated with the management, disillusioned with the mission, or just flat out fed up with the direction of the leadership and you decided I'm done, I've quit, I can do this no longer. Submitting my resignation, I'm turning in my badge and I'm walking away from this organization that I love, from this opportunity that I valued and this position that I have wanted for quite some time, but now things are not the way they used to be. So much has changed and it seems as if we have gotten away from the reason that I joined in the first place. Have any of you ever been there? Have any of you ever resigned from something? Well, all around us, each and every day, people are becoming increasingly discouraged by the treatment on their job, by the direction of their social group, and, and many even by the lack of fulfillment in their relationship. And rather than just staying there and toughing it out, as many people did years and years ago, enduring years and decades of unhappiness, today people are just quitting. They're just walking away and resigning and pursuing some other opportunity because they'd rather be happy and free by themselves than to be miserable and in bondage in a situation that is not bringing them joy. Come on, talk to me 
that is not bringing them peace and value to their lives. Well, it turns out that the same way that people are resigning or stepping away from various secular organizations, people are doing the same thing with the church. It's not so much that they don't value or esteem or have regard for the church, but they are tired of the hypocrisy, the mismanagement, the scandals, and the blatant contradictions. And so more and more people are submitting their resignations. They are turning in their membership badges and saying, no, that's okay, I don't wanna be a part of this thing any longer. Sometimes it's more obvious, other times it is more subtle. People start drifting further and further away from the church. They start coming less and less frequently as they used to. And before you know it, they're gone. According to one study, almost 70% of people who came up in the church leave it by the time they are young adults. 32% say it's because the church is too judgmental. 29% say it's because they don't feel connected to the people in the church. 25% say it's because the church's political and social views on matters such as sexuality, gender identity, justice, and poverty are not commensurate with their values, beliefs, and understanding of a good, great, and a compassionate God. But whatever it is and whatever the reason, more and more people find their love for the church eclipsed, not by the Savior for whom the church stands, but by the people who occupy the pews in the church. It was Gandhi who said that he liked Jesus, but if it weren't for Christians, then he'd be a Christian himself. And to a large extent, I get it. I, I too find myself frustrated and aggravated and irritated by the repressive and sometimes repress, oppressive nature of the church. And, and at times, it makes me want to holler and throw up my hands. Now, now I want to be clear with you, the church that I and many others are struggling with is not the church with a capital C. The church that Jesus built when he said in Matthew 16, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. No, the church people are struggling with is the church with the lower KC, the church built by man, built by humanity, the one that condoned, funded, and justified slavery, the church that rationalized the subordination of women, the church that supported segregation, and the church today that seems silent on matters of injustice, poverty, and inequality, and seems uh, more preoccupied with power and profits over people and their plight and their pain. To be clear, that's the church that people are walking away from, uh, the church that allowed priests and clergy to molest young boys and to do nothing about it, the church that is more concerned with growing its budget than with growing its people. The church that is more interested in policing people's uh, private bedrooms and is silent about what's happening in corporate boardrooms. Uh, they have a lot to say uh, about what you do in your house, but they have developed religious laryngitis about critiquing and calling to task the immorality in the White House. The church that claims to be pro-life before the baby is born, but opposes programs and policies around education and healthcare and recreation that enhance the life of the baby after it is born. Uh, people of all ages, all backgrounds, all races are resigning from the church, the, the hate-filled church, the power-hungry church, the intolerant church. They are, they are not leaving God, don't get it twisted. Uh, they just don't like some of his children. And I get it. Perhaps this is happening because the church in so many instances is not very Christian. We wave the flag, the banner of Jesus Christ. We believe in creeds about Jesus Christ, but we have fallen short of living the example of Christ. Perhaps the remedy for the mass exodus from the church is for churches and those in it to be more Christian, to be more committed to lifting people up than in putting people down, to be more committed to spreading love and not hatred, to be more committed to peace and not war and a, a raising hope rather than fear during slavery our ancestors had a song they sung entitled have you got good religion 
Really, the older version of the song said, is you got good religion? It went a little something like this. Have you got good religion? And then the chorus would respond, certainly, Lord. Have you got good religion? The chorus would respond, certainly, Lord. A third time, have you got good religion? Certainly, 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 Lord. Well, they asked that question because our ancestors understood that not all religion is good religion. And not all people who say they are Christian really follow Christ. The Crusades, the Spanish Inquisition, Southern lynching, sexual misconduct by the clergy, Hobby Lobby, have all been committed in the name of Jesus by people who claimed to follow Christ. That's my struggle with the co-opting of Kanye West here recently by conservative evangelicals. They've always had no problem with us singing and dancing as long as it didn't lead to encouraging the masses to challenge mass and trying to be free. They have no problem with you rapping, brother, about Jesus being king as long as you go out there and tell black people and white people for that matter that slavery was a choice uh, and imply that all of the problems in the black community are the result of the individual behavior and not structural inequalities that predetermine second class status for the majority of black and brown people as, as long as you go out there and tell people they need to support a president who is making it acceptable in America to hate again that's not good religion and whereas in the past people stayed and put up with conflicting, contradictory, and compromised Christianity, today they don't. And the only way that's going to change is for the church to become Christian. One of the greatest examples of religion run amok is found right here in John chapter 8. The Bible says that while Jesus was teaching in the temple, the religious scholars brought to him a woman that they had caught, the text says, in the very act of adultery. You do know what adultery is, don't you? They used then a scripture they found either from Leviticus or Deuteronomy to condemn this woman and said she should be stoned to death because of the deed that she had done. Their real intent was to use the incident to discredit Jesus. For if he had said stone her, then he would have been guilty of contradicting Roman law. But if he said let her go, then he would have been guilty of contradicting the Hebrew Bible. They cared nothing about this woman. They cared nothing about her shame or her story or what led her to this moment in her life. All they cared about was using her as a means to justify an ends. And it appears, church, that Jesus peeped their game. The same way that they were peeping in her window, Jesus peeped their game. And rather than feeding into their phony religious game of fake piety, he bends down and writes something on the ground. And he said to them, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. And the Bible says slowly, one by one, the men with rocks in their hands dropped their stones from the eldest to the youngest and they walked away. What a powerful example of how we ought to respond in the face of religious hypocrisy today. Jesus, show us, I think, how the church could be better if we were more Christian. And first of all, he says this to us, that if the church was Christian, we wouldn't use the Bible to put God in a box. Are y'all here today? These pompous, arrogant, self-appointed protectors of the religious status quo felt emboldened by the fact that they had found a Bible verse that buttressed their bigotry, their ignorance, and their stance. Look right there. It's in the A clause of verse 5. They appeal to this one verse, either in the book of Leviticus or in the book of Deuteronomy, to claim that the woman ought to be stoned. Isn't it amazing how people can take their understanding Understanding of a phrase in the Bible and build an entire theology and doctrine around one phrase, around one sentence or one 
word and make it appear as if God is somehow confined to their understanding of one phrase. We hear it all the time. You know when people say things like only Christians are going to heaven because of this verse here. You know when they say if you aren't baptized in the name of Jesus that if the preacher said in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost you're really not saved. That if you don't speak in tongues because according to this verse right here you're really not a saved Christian. You know you hear them that women shouldn't wear makeup, that women uh, can't cut their hair, that they ought to have a hat on when they come in the church because uh, of this verse here. You know Christians they say aren't supposed to have Christmas trees, uh, not supposed to have tattoos uh, and they got some uh, arcane verse somewhere where they have put a piece here and a piece there and constructed a uh, the Are y'all here today? You know what they say. Uh, Christians are not supposed to listen uh, to secular music. Can't go to the movies. Uh, can't drink wine. Can't dance. Can't, can't go on a date. Can't play cards uh, before 6 p.m. on Sunday. When I grew up, uh, you could play cards Monday through Saturday. But my mama, who was at the earliest service, mama said, you can't play cards uh, on Sunday before 6.30. And so I was there every Sunday at 557 uh, 558, 559, sick, good, cut the deck. I, but can't, can't play cards. Come on, are y'all here today? <laughs> You know, if you're a Christian, you can't be divorced, can't have sex as an adult. If you're not married, can't be gay, can't go to concerts. They have this long list of prohibitions that they feel comfortable hiding behind because they found a verse in the Bible. You do know that it, you can find just about a verse to justify and substantiate any kind of foolishness. They hide behind a Bible verse to justify their decontextualized view of God, Jesus, and the Bible. And as a historian of religion, Bible scholar, and pastor who has been a devout Christian my entire life, I have spent my entire career since the time I was young studying scripture, theology, ethics, and the history of the church. And I have found myself constantly asking myself, where in the world do people get all of this stuff from? Where do they find, where, where they find a word in the Bible, a phrase, and think that they're decontextualized? understanding of the word enables them to build this large theological edifice upon one tiny word. Well, I had an experience some time ago that helped me to understand what's happening. I visited the Smithsonian and there in the Smithsonian that year, there was this skeleton of a huge dinosaur. I don't know how big it was. It was about 100 feet long and 50 feet high. And I was really amazed and, and I read the plaque about this dinosaur that existed in prehistoric times. And I was shocked to discover that this skeleton of a 100 foot dinosaur was really created from a handful of bones of the actual dinosaur that they had found. Stay with me here. In other words, out of this 100 foot long and 50 foot high dinosaur, they've only found a little toe bone. And they only found a fraction of a femur bone. And out of this small handful of bones, they fabricated the rest of the, of the skeleton based upon the paleontologist's imagination and their best guess. And it then dawned on me, church, that much of what we think of when it comes to the church is the same way. We have this huge architecture of doctrine and theology and religious practice that are really extrapolations in the minds of men centuries and millennia after the life of Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus does say in Matthew 16 and 18, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But we should never delude ourselves into thinking that most of what we assume the church ought to be about came directly from the mouth and the mind 
mind of Jesus Christ institutional church with all of its regalia and gothic cathedrals pomp and circumstance clergy clergy hierarchies elaborate creeds and doctrines are after the time of Jesus Christ it is not the church of scripture that was committed to feeding the hungry and clothing the naked and setting at liberty them that are bruised and helping the widows and the orphans when we think of the church we tend to think now of that institution that guards the pearly gates of heaven determining who's going to get in and who's going to get out we focus on what we people believe but not on how they behave people can believe a whole lot of stuff. People can believe the right things and yet behave in the wrong way. They can believe in the Trinity and still support slavery. They can believe in the Godhead, the Father, Son and the Holy Ghost and still support segregation. They can believe in the divinity of Christ, the inspiration of scripture, the resurrection of the dead and the return of Christ and still believe that people of color ought to be subjected to second class citizenship. The modern church has convinced itself that it possesses the only way, the only normative definition of faith, and that everybody else is going to hell. And while these beliefs are strongly held and sincerely affirmed, they are really based on a few real bones. They are only based on a few real authentic traditions and sayings that actually came from Jesus himself. The rest is fabricated to coalesce the power of men and women that wanted to use the church and the institution of the church to advance their power. And I believe the church would be much further along today if we stopped trying to confine God to a sentence in the Bible. Bible and using that sentence to stop dialogue and to preclude conversation and to kill debate. We should stop that because it is giving millennials and giving young people and giving the world a wrong picture of who God is and what God stands for. God is more than that church. Tell your neighbor God is bigger than that. I tell your other neighbor don't put God in a box. This brand of Christianity presents itself as the only way that people can access the reality of God. Philip Gully in his book, If God Were Christian, says that this view was a poor advertisement for the reality of God. By putting God in a box and confining him to a creed and fixing him to a set of doctrines and restricting him to a set of Bible verses, the world has become disillusioned by an institution that has insisted on conformity rather than freedom and liberty and has been silent at times in our history when it could have been and should have been taken a stand for the least and the lost. Too often the church has aligned itself with the powerful and the immoral and in the process it has turned people off, neglecting our responsibility to be the voice for the outcast, to lift up those who have been locked out and to welcome in those who have been forgotten. I get asked all the time, when I go around the country, when I speak to seminarians and future ministers, I'm often asked, what do I attribute the growth of the ministry that God has given me? And after giving glory to God, because I do give glory to God, I say to them, well, I think we have grown because I try to help people understand that you can love God without being weird. Y'all not here. <laughs> I grew up in a church where being a Christian was defined by a list of prohibitions about what you cannot do. But in the Bible that I read, Jesus said, I came that you might have life and that you might have that life more abundantly. Have I got a witness in the house today? And most of the people who are saying what they say about God in the church, about you can't do this and you can't do that, are doing so for the same reason 
reasons that the Pharisees in the text did. They said what they said because, not because they had studied it, but because they got it from somebody who got it from somebody else, who heard it from somebody else, and that person didn't read the Bible in their original languages. Y'all not here. You ever wonder where in the world do people get all of this stuff where they say about who can be pleased and accepted by God? It's because they got it from somebody who heard it from somebody else who got it from somebody else and that person didn't read the Bible in its original Greek and Hebrew languages. Y'all not here. Tell your neighbor one last time, don't put God in a box. Secondly, the church could be more Christian if it valued people more than compliance. What I find redeeming about this text is that Jesus does not seek to expose this woman's brokenness. He does not ask who she's been sleeping with and why she was with them. As a matter of fact, Jesus doesn't even address her first at all. Those who sought to stone her seem bent upon imposing a kind of religious conformity that demanded doctrinal orthodoxy over being sensitive to this woman's humanity. And what, woman, what one gets from reading this text is a sense that Jesus is more interested in affirming her humanity, affirming her personhood, than in protecting some notion of doctrinal purity. So many people are turned off from the church because the church is more interested in getting the orthodox position right. But in the process, we lose people in the process. Same way that the Pharisees during Jesus' day debated whether it was appropriate for Jesus to heal upon the certain day. The church today spends more of its time trying to hold people up to some religious purity test than it does focusing on caring for people as human beings. Jesus is less interested in their acceptance than he is in seeing this woman as a person. He didn't want to shame her. He didn't want her to feel guilty. He didn't want her to come to church and leave feeling embarrassed. And this is what I love about God. Because God stands with us when the world is trying to stone us. What I love about God is that God stands with us when the world is out there trying to throw rocks at us. You know you didn't do this right. And you know that you didn't do that right. God wants us to be the kind of church that stands up for people when the world is trying to put them down. God wants us to lift people up. Have I got a witness here when the world is trying to push them away? And I believe there's some witnesses here who can thank God that God welcomed you back in when the people in the world were trying to push you away. God wants us to be the kind of church that is willing to help people and welcome people and love and support people even if they have pre-existing conditions. That's what I like about God. God is not like some health insurance plan. God is willing to help us. God is willing to bless us even if we have some pre-existing conditions and this whole entire passage is like an invitation to discipleship where Jesus is letting the Pharisees then and the Pharisees now know that people don't have to be perfect without blemish, without stain, without fault and without wrinkles in order to be used by God. Have I got a witness here? I remember some time ago I spoke to this brother in the church about being a leader here. And the brother, brother was, uh, he was honored that I had approached him, but he seemed shocked. And I told him that I had observed his faithfulness in the church, his sacrifice, his service. And I told him I thought he would be a great leader. And he thought it over for a minute. I could tell he was thinking about it. But at, 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 at a certain point, he's, he's felt the need to say, Pastor, I need to tell you something. I said, what is it? He said, he said, I'm honored that you asked me to be a leader, but I'm still working on some things. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, I don't have it all together. You know, it's some places I still go. I might not should go there, but there's some places I hang out in that I probably shouldn't hang out there. And there's some words, if you push me far enough, I, I might, that might slip out of my mouth. You know what I mean? And he said, I, 
I'm not sure you want me to be a leader because I don't have it all together. And I had to let him know that leadership in the church does not mean you have it all together. Leadership in the church does not mean that you are perfect. Have I got a witness here? All of us are in process. Have I got a witness here? Don't ever think that those of us in leadership have it all together. And sometimes we miss the human side of what it means to be a Christian. When we do that, it causes us to be more judgmental. What I find interesting about this text is out of the 600 or so laws and ordinances in the Old Testament, these men cherry picked this one command. And they ignored the other 599. How y'all are here today? And that's what religious bigots do. That's what the sanctimonious saints who believe they are guardians of who can get in the pearly gates do. They like to pick and choose the phrases and the verses that they like. And they ignore the other commandments, the others that, that apply to them. And that's what turns people off from the church. When we judge people and what we do when we judge people is that we expose our own hypocrisy. Do you see the hypocrisy in the text? Do you see the double standard? In, it's right there. If they caught the woman in the very act of adultery, somebody say the very act. Somebody say it takes two to tango says they caught the woman in the very act of adultery that means there was a man there also but 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 here they have a verse and they're standing behind the verse and they don't bring the man here's what the bible actually says in the hebrew bible it says if a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor both of them somebody say both of them should be put to death. But these so-called biblical fundamentalists ignore the portion of the text that applied to the men and only brought the, the woman there. And it's that kind of hypocrisy that people are sick and tired of when it comes to the church. Churches that cherry pick the Bible about how people should do this and how people ought to do that. Churches that cherry pick the Bible about how people ought to give to the church but they ignore the person's about how the church ought to get back to the community. Let us never be guilty of this kind of hypocrisy. And anyone reading this text, church, ought to ask themselves a few questions. All y'all here? When you're reading this text, you ought to say to yourself, self, if they caught this woman in the very act of adultery, how did they know where to find her? Now, I, let, let me let me say I, I, when I read it, I, I said, "Self, if they caught her in the very act of adultery, how they know what her address was? It's not like they was out on the street. I'm sure. Sure, the doors were closed. Sure, the windows were closed. How did they know where to find her?" I'm glad you asked. And I, I was reading that question forwards and backwards. Uh, and then I found my answer right there in the text. And we often miss it because we misinterpret Jesus' response. Bump your neighbor. You're going to learn something today. <laughs> we misinterpret Jesus' response right there in verse 7. Verse, I studied the background and I discovered that Jewish law required that the witnesses to a crime be the first to throw the stones. But I also discovered that the witness to the crime, the one throwing the stone, could not be guilty of the particular crime themselves. So, uh-huh. 
That was very interesting to me because it led me to think that we've been misinterpreting verse 7. See, verse 7 says, let any one of you who is without sin cast the first stone. And so we say it time and time again. We assume that the sin referenced here is saying general sin, sin in general. And we assume that Jesus is saying that only the, pers- the perfect person can judge this person. And it then causes people today to take this verse out of context and to say, well, if you ain't perfect, don't judge judge me because ain't none of us is perfect because Jesus says let you who is without sin cast the first stone but that couldn't be what Jesus is referring to because there would be no way justice could be enforced if the judge and the jury had to be sinless and perfect hold on here I'm going somewhere in order to judge someone you could not be guilty of the sin in that particular matter. So he's writing on the ground. You know, Jesus is the omniscient one. He knows everything. I was wondering, what is he writing on the ground? I think he's probably writing their name. He's probably writing down names. <laughs> writing down names of people who've been with her. So here's what he's saying here. Those of you who want to stone this woman who committed adultery, if you are not guilty of adultery yourself, then go ahead and throw a stone. (laughs) Y'all not here. He who is without sin in this particular matter cast the first stone. And the Bible says they put their head down. They dropped their rocks and their stones because here they were, they were trying to judge someone of something that they had done themselves. And you know, it's a whole lot of church people who want to put you down for stuff that they have done and still do them. Y'all not here today. There are people, there are people in church. They want to talk about how you go to the club and they just can't go no more. That's, they can't drop it like it's hot no more. Uh, they, They used to drink. They used to smoke. What Jesus is saying is you got to be careful about judging people for stuff you do yourself. It is just like it's like preachers that I know who publicly condemn homosexuality, but privately they gay. And I'm saying to myself, how in the world you going to condemn them, but you, you gay yourself? It's bizarre to me. And tell your neighbor, drop those stones, take those stones out of your hands. Jesus Jesus says that because he didn't want them then and us now to allow judgment to blind us from the gift of God's grace. He says to this sister, I want you to go. Uh, They don't condemn you and neither do I. I want you to go because your future is greater than where you've been. Jesus stands up and he says to to this sister that I don't berate you. I don't belittle you. I'm not going to interrogate you because what God has ahead of you, sister, is greater than what's behind you. He says, sister, you don't have to do this no more. I got more love for you. I got better relationship for you. Is there anybody here today who can thank God that we are recipients of the grace of God and we don't have to allow what happened in our past keep us from experiencing the joy and the good news and the love of Jesus Christ. Have I got a witness in the house today? We serve a God who will release us to our future. Somebody's here today. You came up in a church that tried to put you in bondage, but we serve a God who's a God of a second chance. He's not only a God of a second chance, he's a God of a third chance, a God of a fourth chance. Have I got a witness? Is there anybody here today who can testify? I came here on grace today I drove in here to gra- in grace today have I got a witness in my house today we serve a God who will release you to your future regardless of what has transpired in your past if the church of Christian were Christian it would listen more and judge less If the church were Christian, it would love more and condemn less. It would seek to listen and learn more than to hate less. 
And we could be the church that God wants us to be if we were more Christian. Come on, put your hands together. Give the Lord praise today. No Limits was created to help you strengthen your relationship with Jesus and to help you explore the limitless possibilities for your life. Connect with me today through our website at delmancoats.org. There you will find free resources available for immediate download with no obligation whatsoever. I begin each day thanking God for you and those like you who watch and support this ministry. It is truly a blessing to serve you. Once again, you can find us at delmancoats.org. That's delmancoats.org. And remember to live your life each day with no limits. I want to invite you to join me on an incredible journey through the ancestral trail of African heritage as we visit Ghana in the fall of 2022. Located in the heart of West Africa, Ghana is known for its lush forests, diverse animal life, and miles of sandy beaches along with its rich history. Join me as we pay homage to key figures in black history, enjoy a traditional African naming ceremony, and visit a wonderful museum dedicated to the Ashanti Kingdom. You can learn more about this trip on my website at delmancoats.org. But don't delay in signing up as space is very limited. Thank you for watching today's message and I look forward to traveling with you to Ghana next fall. I am so glad that you took the time to watch this message today. If you have been blessed by this outreach, I'd like to ask you to become a partner in this ministry so that together we can reach the world for Jesus Christ. My heart is to reach people just like you all around the world and to tell them that God loves them and wants to empower them to live a life with no limits. Your financial investment in this ministry will enable us to spread the good news of Jesus Christ around the world so that more people can be inspired and encouraged. Will you help me to reach those people? Will you join me in empowering the lost and the forgotten? Will you be my partner as we teach people to truly live a life with no limits? To make a donation safely and securely, go to our website at delmancoats.org. That's delmancoats.org and look for the donate button on the top right of the homepage. Thank you in advance for your support and for becoming a true partner in No Limits. Your partnership and financial gift will help us impact the world by bringing hope to those who need it. Your generosity today is a reminder of the goodness of God. Thank you again for watching No Limits with Pastor Delman. The preceding program was brought to you by the faithful supporters of No Limits and Mount Enon Baptist Church in Clinton, Maryland.